Good afternoon and welcome to a very special episode of The Angry Astronaut. On Tuesday, I had the opportunity to interview Dr. McGann Christian, and she is one of the few graduates of the ESA astronaut program. She's a reserve astronaut. Regrettably, only one astronaut from the UK is going to get an opportunity to go to space, at least through ESA, over the course of the next decade or so because of the way things work with ESA. And as a result, the UK Space Agency is planning to send up a mission with four British astronauts through Axiom and SpaceX. Unfortunately, they have to get the money for this mission entirely through private sources. It was made clear that this was a mission that was going to be supported only by non-taxpayer money and that no taxpayer money was going to be spent on this. And even though the UK Space Agency is very comfortable with this arrangement, I'm not. And at the end of this interview, or rather the end of part one of this interview, you're going to hear exactly why. I think the UK taxpayers should invest in this mission and why it's so important but before we bring you my opinions on this matter, which, by the way, do not reflect the UK Space Agency's opinions whatsoever, need to be clear about that, I need to bring you all of the amazing new information coming from Dr. Christian and from the UK Space Agency coming at you right now. Good afternoon, folks, and welcome to a very special episode here on The Angry Astronaut. Um, I've had an opportunity to visit the UK Space Agency once again. Um, fantastic folks here who have really given me an insight into some incredible work that they're doing here. And today, would you be so kind, we have a very special guest with us here today to introduce yourself to the viewers. Hi, my name is Megan Christian. I'm a reserve astronaut with the European Space Agency, and here at the UK Space Agency, I'm Exploration Commercialization Lead. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, actually talking to an astronaut candidate here as somebody who's been through the process and everything. So obviously, I think the viewers are going to want to know about some of that first. Can you tell me what makes ESA's astronaut program, the selection process, you know, and then whatever comes afterwards, what makes that different from NASA's program, or is it essentially identical? And what's involved, you know, let's let's say that a that a young child in you know Bulgaria or you know or just somewhere you know an Eastern European country that has never sent anybody to space let's say they want to go someday what's involved in the process well firstly you have to be part of a, a citizen of a member state of the European the European Space Agency right um, a lot of people worry about Brexit the UK is no longer in the European Union but it's a member state of the European Space Agency so that's a completely separate thing right um, but the biggest difference with uh, compared to the NASA selections is that it's just they don't happen as often. Yeah. So, I mean, before my selection, which started in 2021, the previous one was back in 2009. So it took 12, 13 years for them to have another astronaut selection. The idea is that they'll be more frequent in the future as more flights become available. Right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's the biggest difference for now. So we actually had about 23,000 applicants uh, for wow. this round. <laughs> <laughs> Opened in, uh, applications closed in June 2020, 2021. Um, and then it was about an 18 month process, six different phases. And what they were looking for is somebody from a science, engineering, medicine, or aviation test pilot kind of background. Uh -huh. You needed to have a master's plus three years of professional experience in your field. Um, and then from there, there were a number of nice to haves, you know, things like scuba diving, uh, experience in extreme conditions, uh, additional languages, additional degrees. Uh, so the first of all, you had to submit uh, your motivation letter and, uh, and the CV, obviously, you had to answer a questionnaire about these additional characteristics. And then they screened through that. So right. starting from about 23,000 people, they then had to cut it down to about 1,400. Right. Um, who could then go through to the next round, which was computer-based testing. They tested us on things like maths and physics, uh, a lot of tough memory questions, yeah. actually. <laughs> <laughs> um, using a joystick, like you might use in, in an aeroplane, for right. example. Um, so that was done 
over a, quite a long period of time because they had to get through 1,400 people. It was COVID era, era so wow, it took yeah. several months to actually be able to get through that. True. Then the next phase was the psychological round. Uh, so talking one-on-one -on -one to psychologists in a, with a panel of psychologists. We did teamwork exercises, um, pair exercises as well, a lot of different questionnaires. May I stop you there for a moment? Yeah. Um, what would you say is ESA and NASA's primary concerns when they're talking about potential psychiatric pitfalls? What, what are they trying? I mean, obviously, there are many things that could go wrong psychologically out in space that you don't want to have happen. Where, where is the focus there? What are they looking for in terms of that? I think one of the biggest things is just being able to work in a team as both a leader and a follower, mm -hmm. um, not, you know, not wanting to be the, the alpha personality, um, but at the same time being able to step up. Um, obviously, looking for outlying conditions um, sure. that could that could you know be a problem for for a potential mission. Also, somebody who's calm under pressure. Um, has maybe had experience in risky environments in the past and knows how to manage those risks. Right. And they actually don't want people who would do a one-way mission to Mars, for example. Sure. They, they want people, you know, who love Earth <laughs> right. as well. And, and so have a good level of, of risk management and understanding of the risk that is involved, but not being out there and... and wanting to kill themselves you know yeah, what sure. I mean yeah um, just being being willing to accept the risk but at the same time being willing to, to to mitigate it as much as possible sure not actively seeking really dangerous situations yeah, <laughs> yeah that makes a great deal of sense uh, so that actually leads me to another question um, that a lot of people have been asking lately as we transfer to a commercial Mm -hmm. space station environment as people start going to space stations simply because they have lots of money and not necessarily because they've been through this vetting process are there any concerns amongst ESA and NASA in terms of what that could mean in the future because then you're not filtering these folks out quite as well yeah I think I think there is a concern about this and so there will have to be regulations around it and that's something that the whole sort of space community human space like communities is going to have to struggle with as right. as you know I, I think it's great that there's going to be more access to space but we just have to do it carefully yeah definitely I'm sorry to have cut you off by the mm -hmm. way through the process you didn't cover those those remaining steps um, or, yeah or, okay so so after the psychological round um, there are about 400 people by that point um, and then about 100 people got through to the next stage, which were the medical tests. Mm -hmm. And we did a full week of medical testing. Yeah. Um, so they really, really wanted to make sure that you're not, not a risk for them in the future. You know, sure. they're investing a lot of money into their astronauts. So they want to make sure that they can, they can make the most of, of you course, of going course. forward. Um, after that, there was a panel interview um, with people um, from the European Astronaut Center, uh, from the Human Space Flight Program at the European Space Agency, astronauts as well. Uh, I actually found this to be the hardest part of the whole process. Mm. It, it's kind of, you know, you, you, you expect to do a panel interview, right? Everybody sure. has to do a panel interview for their job. Right, right. But um, I did find it particularly challenging because any time that they thought you were in your comfort zone and talking about something that you were very happy to talk about, they would take you right out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it wasn't just sort of questions about hypothetical situations on the International Space Station. It was also questions that journalists might ask you, questions that children might ask you, or that politicians might ask right. you. Right. So it was quite. It was quite broad. Yeah, definitely. How does uh, how engaged is NASA in the process, or do they let Europe handle their own process? Yeah, not at all. Yeah, so it's all it's all the European Space Agency. Great. I mean, I th I think there's uh, probably when the European Space Agency was setting up their selections process, they they certainly would have gotten a lot of advice from NASA. Sure. And looking back on that history of of how NASA does astronaut recruitment, um, but no, the the process is is completely independent. And doctor, what's your uh, what's your educational background yourself? So I uh, did a Bachelor of Engineering in industrial chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate enough to have uh, what's called a co-op scholarship, which meant that I could do some industrial training placements along the way as well. So I did things like I worked at a wastewater treatment plant and I worked at a place that made paint for steel roofs and mm -hmm. that kind of thing, which was uh, a great experience to get. But in the end, I decided to stay on in academia. Right. So I did a PhD 
And in my PhD, I was researching nanomaterials for hydrogen storage, wow. so fuel cell vehicles. Um, Indeed. Yeah, so okay. that was that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, I, I was kind of of, of two minds. I wasn't sure whether to do it or not. My supervisor bribed me by giving me chocolate and saying that I could go overseas. So <laughs> so <laughs> so apparently that reason. was enough. Yeah, yeah. that works. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, then uh, after my PhD, I was looking for a postdoc and I wanted to do it in Europe. Um, so just to give you a bit more background there, I was born in the UK, but okay. I grew up in Australia. Okay. Um, and my parents are New Zealanders. So, How about that? Yeah, okay. I have those three citizenships and then I moved to Italy for my postdoc for right. what, what was supposed to be a one to two year postdoc. I ended up staying there for nine years uh, working on a material called graphene. Um, and yes. so I got Italian citizenship as well. So I have four citizenships, which wow. is a little bit strange, <laughs> but uh, yeah. it's nice to have. Yeah. Uh, that's very nice <laughs> to have, actually. That's great. Yeah, interesting. My daughter is a uh, is um, almost finished her bachelor's in mechanical engineering, mm -hmm. um, and we'll see where she moves on to. Yeah. It's been nuclear power plants up to this okay, point, right. um, so we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Anyway, enough yeah. about that. Um, all right, so let's move on to uh, that, what I think everybody who's watching this content wants to hear about, and that is the whole thing involved with Axiom mm. and Britain's ambition of sending four British astronauts. Can you? What can you tell me about that? I know there's a limited amount that you can tell me, but you know, perhaps aspirationally, or perhaps what the UK Space Agency would like to see happen. Yeah, so I mean, my colleagues are working extremely hard on this, so we're really hoping it will happen. But the idea is that um, we're investigating the possibility of having this uh, private astronaut mission, um, but through, you know, it, we're gov government astronauts. That's the, I think pr the name private astronaut mission is going to change sometime in the future yeah. because increasingly, you know, it's governmental astronauts like Axiom 3 at the moment. Um, the reserve, the European Space Agency reserve astronaut from Sweden, Marcus Funt, is currently on the International Space Station waiting to come down. Um, so I think that, that that name is going to change, but that for now, that's what it's called. Um, so investigating the possibility of having a British... Um, private astronaut mission uh, with, with Axiom. And the idea is that this would be fully commercially funded, so no, no taxpayer money. That's probably the biggest hurdle to overcome is, sure. is getting the sponsorship for that. Um, so that's very much in progress at the moment. Later this month, we'll be releasing a call uh, for, the, for science and technology uh, experiments and payloads. Wow. So hopefully we'll get a lot of interest in that. We had quite a lot of interest in when we did a kind of expression of interest call back in December. So I think there are a lot of people really excited about the possibility. So has the UK Space Agency already made its selections for these four people? That is not public information, unfortunately. Gotcha. I uh, but understand. I mean, the, it would be in cooperation with the European Space Agency. Mm -hmm. um, and there are four European Space Agency astronauts. Tim Peake has retired, but he, he's formerly European Space Agency. Right. And there's Rosemary, who's a career astronaut, John McFall, who's a um, power astronaut, and myself, who's a reserve astronaut. So. Right. The, who are, so, so we have four British people, coincidentally, who are your ESA <laughs> astronauts right now. Yeah, so, although there, so, there's, been, there's been no... The, the crew right. has not been selected. Sure, we don't just, know for sure. Yeah. But we have four ESA astronauts who also happen to be British. Okay, that's, that's, and that's all we can say. That's fine. Um, of course, obviously, I'm sure everybody is, especially our British viewers, are becoming increasingly excited about this, I think, the more that we talk about it. So what is it that... What advantages can come to Britain by sending four British astronauts up now, as opposed to waiting for to go through the normal selection process for ESA, you know, and just doing things the old-fashioned way? Why send four British people now? Yeah, but it's a, it's a very legitimate question. I mean, soon enough, there will certainly be a UK astronaut through the European Space Agency doing a long duration mission to, to the ISS. That, that will happen. Um, but there's something really potentially inspirational about se spe sending four British astronauts at once. And not only that, it actually means that we get a lot more time for British experiments. So when uh, the European Space Agency sends an astronaut for, for a long-term mission, they have a certain amount of time that they can ded dedicate to uh, ESA experiments. That's about 8% of their time. 
um, just because of the way that the agreements work between, you sure. know, the amount of money that, that ESA spends on the International Space right. Station. They're be. obligated to take care of everybody. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's maintenance and things like that. Right. Whereas with a private astronaut mission, you can spend all of your time on the experiments that you take. So if you think about it, you're taking four British astronauts who can spend all of their time on right. British experiments. That's actually more time than, than the European Space Agency would normally get in an entire year's worth of astronaut missions. Yeah, and that's actually something that I think a lot of people, when they talk about you know, private missions, when this stuff gets circulated in the general press, you know, when, when Axiom has done these previous missions, they, just, they look upon this as a bunch of rich guys who are just going to space to have fun or whatever. They never talk about all of the science, especially most of it medically oriented, I understand, that all of these people do. Do when they go up to the IS. Would you say that's a good assessment that in general that's what Axiom does when they send these people up? Yeah, I mean, I, I think at first uh, companies like Axiom and some of the other commercial spaceflight providers were looking down a kind of space tourism road. Sure. Um, but I think that has evolved quite a lot to be, as we were mentioning earlier, more of a, a government astronaut or, you know, people who want to do experiments on the International Space Station. Uh, so I, I think there's been quite an evolution between Axiom 1, then even Axiom 2 and Axiom 3, uh, where it's been completely dedicated to, to science right. and technology. So yeah, it's it's interesting, and and I think we need to we need to realize that it's it's not space tourism. It's actually you know we, we just in a shorter amount of time we're doing the kind of experimentation that always happens on the International Space Station, and you can kind of think oh well you know it's just a short duration mission. What does that mean? But looking back at the space shuttle era, most flights were for two weeks. Yeah. So uh, a lot of you can get a, a lot of really useful experiments done. So I've. I've as, have any ideas already been put forward as to things that uh, that these folks might be able to accomplish? I know you, you're going to have it call out, you know, for ideas, but have any specific ideas already been thought of? Yeah, I mean, people people sort of come to us with, with ideas all the time. Um, biomedical experiments, for example, um, growing crystals in, in microgravity is a really um, interesting thing that's been studied for many years. But what it means is that you can um, learn more about diseases and you can also develop new, new drugs. And these things are actually coming online as commercial applications towards the future. There's bioprinting, printing organs in space, mm -hmm. 3D printing of uh, components as well. And then on material science, I mean, as a material science, I'm interested in, the, in that side of things too. You can, um, you can uh, fabricate semiconductors and this kind of thing. So there's all sorts of interesting commercial applications that are coming out of experiments from the International Space Station. And earlier today, I was just speaking with uh, somebody from Space Solar, who, and, yeah. and they're really interested in having an experiment on the International Space Station uh, for space-based solar power. Right. So this means getting energy from the sun and beaming it back to Earth from space where you don't have the problem of the the loss of energy as it comes as the solar energy comes through the atmosphere. Right. So um, yeah, they'd really they'd be really keen as well. Fantastic. Um, it all sounds very exciting. So tell me a little bit. Um, let's 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 delve since we've discussed quite a number of kind of broad categories of mm. things that could be done. Let's get a little bit more into depth in terms of the actual reasons to do these sorts of things in space. For example, three D printing organs, trying to make organ procurement and organ thing organ banks a thing of the past. Why is it better to do that in microgravity versus doing it here on Earth? The interesting thing about 3D printing organs is that you can do it on Earth, but it just collapses. So it's no longer actually 3D and you can't have, you, you, need, you need special templates, uh, which might be rejected by the body, uh, problems like this. Whereas if you don't have gravity, you don't have the problems of those organs then collapsing in on themselves um, during the, the 3D printing process. So you can actually get an organ that you couldn't get on Earth 
and even if you could get it on Earth, it's a lot higher quality. So correct me if I'm wrong here. So essentially what we're looking at is the ultimate method of cloning organs. And then if you have cloned organs in a bank, in orbit or wherever, or you just make them in orbit and bring them down here, whatever, then you no longer have the problems of tissue rejection. You no longer have exactly, yeah. the things that plague you know, organ transplants all the time, plus the simple availability of these organs. Yeah, I mean, oh. the, 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 the new availability is going to be a game changer. For, for people who are, who are waiting for organs. Yeah. So tell me something. Is this something that, um, are these, these, these benefits to mankind, are these, this is the sort of thing that the UK Space Agency is trying to talk a lot about, um, you know, putting it forward as, as a benefit to the common person as opposed to simply the scientific benefits? Is, is that a you know, message that you'd like to get out there? Yeah, I mean, our, our whole aim is to bring the, spe the benefits of space to Earth. Um, and that is from, from things like the experiments that we've been talking about. It's also from Earth observations for climate change mis mitigation. It's also space sustainability, so removal of, of the debris that we have going around our Earth, and then things like space-based solar power. So it's all about providing benefits for the people on Earth. So at this point, we're going to pause in our interview with Dr. Christian, switch gears and move over to why I think that the British public should really consider investing in this mission as well. Yes, these are tough economic times. Yes, there are many important things that the British government should be spending their money on. And yes, this is expensive, probably about a quarter of a billion pounds overall. But here's why the government should at least match any funds contributed in the private sector. Because the lives of so many people depend on it. Plain and simple. There are a wide variety of different types of drugs and new medical technologies that simply won't work in gravity. And that's something that I think we've made very clear in the course of this interview. But I'd like to bring the human impact a little closer to home and introduce you to a couple of friends of mine. I don't make friends very easily, by the way. And in the course of my months and years actually that I've spent in the United Kingdom, only a small handful have actually become close enough to where I've really regarded them as being good friends. And these two people are Matt Clark and Andy Law, both of whom, sadly, are cancer patients. Let's go ahead and get started with Matthew Clark, who was kind enough to join me in an interview earlier this week. So my name is Matthew Clark and I live in West Cornwall, being treated at the Royal Cornwall Hospital in uh, the Lowen Ward and the Headland Unit. And uh, so, first of all, I'm being treated for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and I've relapsed twice, so that's two treatments that haven't worked. That was standard chemotherapy therapy first, then chemotherapy mixed with a stem cell transplant second. So, do I think that space pharmaceuticals can help people like me? Well, yes. I mean, uh, all research into cancer treatments is essential and the amount of work that is going in is really uplifting and you see new stories come through all the time and um, we see that this uh, European Space Initiative is looking to develop cancer drugs in orbit. So. Um, and once there are things like a base on the moon on you know lower gravity and uh, we've got uh, brand new space stations where they can do all this sort of stuff then uh, it'll be a really positive thing for everyone suffering cancer and as we know in the UK one in two people will have an experience of cancer in their lifetimes whatever it might be so uh, a bit of uh, skin cancer removed um, or uh, a, a mole removed or something like that up to you know uh, tumors um, so there's a, a lot that needs to be done and I think that this uh, orbital, low gravity, microgravity work is essential. But I think there needs to be a wider discussion, wider um, understanding 
of how important this work is and what micro, why microgravity is important for the development of these type of drugs. Um, it, it would be a really good campaign because it is mentioned on some reports um, here and there, but when you ask people about what do they think is the benefit of space science, they immediately go back to things like, oh, wasn't um, something to do with Apollo to do with putting uh, Teflon in sort of frying pans? And, <laughs> you know, they always go back to those sort of responses um, and say, well, how, what about, you know, uh, drugs being uh, developed in space? Oh, no, I don't know about that. I don't think there is enough publicity done about this sort of thing at all. So why should the government help fund this mission? Well, I think first of all, there needs to be the publicity about why this sort of mission is essential first. We need to get people talking about how Britain, how Europe, how the world needs to be um, developing these um, ways of testing uh, creating new drugs and also manufacture of these drugs in orbit. I could actually imagine in the not too distant future a whole space station as a drugs development lab and, and maybe you know some of these uh, pharma companies really investing um, into that sort of technology. So um, yes the government does need to be funding this mission no doubt at all about it um, because um, we, we've got to give people their lives back. We could really improve people's life chances and have a lot more cancers as uh, curable uh, and uh, give people their lives back. That's what we need in this country because cancer does too much harm to everyone around us, to people themselves, to their families. Um, and also even to the economy. You think the amount of people who are suffering from cancer through their lives um, who could be um, doing great things. Um, I know a lot of cancers are in older age, but there is also a lot of people, children, people, I'm, I'm still working age, um, who should be out there working, could be out there working, could be out there doing great things if it wasn't for the cancer. So this sort of thing is a must-do investment. Thank you, Matt, for all of this important information and for sharing your experiences with us today. I said that there was going to be two people, two good friends that I had made. Well, one of them, Andy Law, who was a very prolific contributor on the Everyday Astronaut, contributed a wide variety of articles to Tim Dodd's website. He can't tell us anything because he's no longer with us. In December, I went to visit Mr. Law um, in his hospital in Guildford, had an opportunity to speak with his oncologist. His prognosis seemed very hopeful. It seemed like he at least had a couple of years left, and then all of a sudden, a few weeks later, he was gone. And his brother gave me permission to use his photograph, to use his story, and to convey his opinions on this matter. He, too, was well aware of what space research could do, not only for people like him, but for people who suffer from a wide variety of different diseases and medical conditions. This is not a small issue. This is not space tourism. This is not colonizing Mars. This is not some sort of crazy idea. This is research that will save lives if we invest in it now. And I encourage all of you, since I can't do this, I'm not a citizen of the United Kingdom, I encourage all of you to go to your MPs and let them know that the British government, as well as the private industry, needs to invest in this for the well-being of everybody in Britain. Because as you heard Mr. Clark say, one out of every two of you are going to suffer from cancer at some point in your lives. And if that isn't reason enough to do this mission, I don't know what is. Thank you very much for watching. I'll be bringing you part two of this interview in the next few days. And as always, stay angry about space.